Nice, isn't it? Yeah. God, it's hot in here, isn't it? If, if Gary Robson wasn't so famous for taking his clothes off, I'd probably <laughs> take my shirt off. But I'm, even though I'm really hot, I'm going to resist it. I don't know whether this microphone's on or not. Is it on? Good. Wow, I think another trip down memory lane as well. And some interesting crossovers, parallels, and uh, yeah, it really stuff to talk about after, actually. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? Well, I need to get my bits of paper in order, then I do know what I'm talking about. So, rethinking diversity. And um, somebody once said that artists are like weeds. The harder you cut them down, the more vigorously they grow. So there you are, weeds, the archetypal awkward bastards. <laughs> I say bastards, by the way, not bastards. <laughs> anyway, onwards. Uh, disabled people are largely expected to fail. It's virtually impossible for a non-disabled person to imagine that we can succeed. And because to succeed, we need to be like non-disabled people, and we aren't. And I don't think that's because we're trying to be diverse. And many of the disabled people I know, and there's quite a few of them in this room, could be described as awkward bastards. And by that, I mean difficult. And there's a reason for that. Because if you want to get on, you've got to deal with a lot of barriers every day. Now, non-disabled people don't have to face those barriers. And those that do are usually part of another discriminated against minority. <coughs> or the invisibility of disability, either being ignored or being written out of things as disabled people and as we become homogenized within a diversity agenda. I'll give you an example of that, part M of the building regulations. They were instigated many years ago as a response to the lack of regulation in access provision for disabled people into public buildings and the built environment. Now recently they've been revised and they don't mention disability once. They do talk about inclusion and perhaps you might argue that that's a good thing. So when rethinking diversity, the title of this session, does it mean that we've got to stop talking about disability? But first I thought I ought to talk about the actual topic of my presentation, which is disability arts, the forgotten arts movement. I'm not going to show any pictures, because um, it's forgotten arts movement. <laughs> <laughs> So disability arts existed. It made the sort of noise that a tree makes when it falls over in a forest when nobody was listening. And the History of Art timeline, which was emblazoned on the wall at Tate Modern and available in print and curiously showed up in Sean's film, which was um, brilliant, Sean. Real congratulations for that. So. But that timeline references the black art movement and it mentions feminist art, but it doesn't mention disability art. And yet, aligned as it was to the politics of disability, it enlightened, amused, empowered, and politicized thousands of disabled people to challenge discrimination and oppression. It didn't stop those things because disabled people still face discrimination, but it did force change, and a change that led to legislation. And while that legislation has many flaws and weaknesses, it is a small recognition that we have some rights. Now there is no disability related legislation. We've got something called the Equalities Act 2010. Is disability wrapped up or perhaps hidden within another eight protected characteristics? So that's where we are right now. And which takes me back to disability arts. So I want to give some clarity to this forgotten arts movement and we should put it in context. And many people will argue about the dates. Nevertheless, let's say the first wave was around 1986 to 1999. And I think Clement Greenberg, the art critic, said in New York in the 1940s that perhaps fewer than 40 people actually knew anything about the ideas behind abstract expressionism. And I think in England in the mid-1980s, perhaps the same number of people knew about disability arts. Feminist art is described as art by women artists made consciously in the light of developments in feminist art theory. And the art historian Linda Nocklin published a groundbreaking essay entitled Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? In it, she investigated the social and economic factors that have prevented talented women 
from achieving the same status as their male counterparts. And we could equally ask, why have there been no great disabled artists? The Marxist critic John Berger in his book Ways of Seeing concluded that men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. In other words, Western art replicates the unequal relationships already embedded in society. And of course, that unequal relationship is true for disabled people. When thinking about being looked at, which of us as obviously disabled people have not been subject to scrutiny, openly stirred at, and asked impertinent questions? It's something that I call the unintended performer phenomenon. And now, if we think about framing the disability arts movement between 86 and 99, it doesn't mean that disabled artists didn't make art that could be described as disability arts before the 1980s, or in fact that they've stopped making disability arts. That would be like saying that black artists have stopped making art from a black aesthetic, or women artists have stopped making work derived from a feminist perspective. And I thought here a quote from the artist Judy Chicago, one of the pioneering feminist artists who made the seminal work that many of you will know called The Dinner Party. And this quote resonated with me for this event today. She said quite recently, I didn't make myself an outsider. The art world made me one. I didn't make myself an outsider. The art world made me one. I thought about that, that quote uh, uh, quite a lot. And I'm wondering who it is that tells us who we are. So am I different or am I treated differently? So disability arts are commonly defined as art made by disabled artists that is informed by or reflects the personal experience of disability. By this definition, the production of disability art continues, but I don't think this constitutes a movement. If pressed, I would describe the movement as something developed in England that grew from the politicization of disability throughout the 1980s. The disability as a phenomenon was not a medical issue, as was widely then perceived, but was a social construct. And the politicization of disabled people came from the head and the heart. The political and academic thinking informed the head. The emotional response, driven by the arts, informed the heart. And I think this potent combination created real change. And the notion of a disability arts culture and community, that we shared cultural oppressions, even though we might have different impairments and different life experiences. And out of this notion of a shared disability culture came poetry, song, comedy, and visual arts. The first wave of disability arts was countercultural. It celebrated difference, but many would go on to argue that disability arts became misappropriated as a result of the development of the equalities agenda and the false idea that disabled people would, as a result of legislative change and the impact of disability equality training, be liberated in some way. And I don't think this has been the case. Some would argue that the purity of disability arts slipped from our grasp, intellectually and culturally, and has been appropriated, in essence sold out for the promise of potential funding opportunities that have failed to materialise in any real sense. Is this the rethinking of disability or diversity that we mean? And because disability is not seen as sexy or aspirational by the majority, the notion of disability is not valued and in many respects so it's viewed as disposable. Disabled people are increasingly subject to disability hate crime, and many hospitalised live in fear of the do not resuscitate label placed on a life considered by others less worth living. This thinking permeates to the art and culture of disabled people. If not dismissed as therapy, then often considered second rate, but for no tangible reason, just simply not valued. So, did this largely forgotten disability arts movement suddenly rise to the surface of public consciousness by the recent cultural Olympiad? Or was the notion of a movement dissipated following the winning of some flawed and toothless anti-discrimination legislation? A sense that inclusion was there for the taking. When in 2012, the cultural Olympiad and then Unlimited shed some light and a little cash on creative disabled people, for the first time, a few disabled artists had the opportunity to think big and to realise some really ambitious projects. And we all now wait eagerly to see if that investment will be sustained or if the growing age of austerity, these aspirations will be left to fall away. 
Of course, all these artists are not new. They've been developing their work over many years, even though the work may, not, may have seemed new and novel to many of those who'd never seen it before. But it's not just important to fund artists. One of the difficulties we face is the lack of investment in the gathering together of our history, history no, history, history, and evaluating and archiving our work. There are no historic institutions for disabled people other than, other than those big houses in the country where many of us faced incarceration in the form of care and control, hidden from society because we didn't fit, or rather society and the infrastructure didn't fit us. Nevertheless, these misfits have made some incredible, powerful, exciting and moving work. And I've been trying for a long time with other allies, notably Joe Bidder and Alan Sutherland, to establish the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive. And we should know soon if we've got the funds from HLF to add to the Arts Council's funds to give us the first ever opportunity to fully document and articulate the history of disability arts. So why has it taken this long? The fact that disability arts is not valued is because disabled people aren't valued. Art in its many forms is a commodity of the rich. Why would they collect and glorify disability arts? It's beyond irony and as such is rightly described as the last avant-garde. This has no reflection on quality. There are works of great power created by disabled artists. That there are no examples in any of our national collections says more about the elitism of those institutions and of the commodity brokers and kingmakers who reign over them than of the work of disabled artists. Colin Barnes, in his seminal book, Disabled People in Britain, talks about us as misfits, and in many ways we still are. In those days, we were incarcerated in institutions on the hill, segregated into impairment categories and shut away in ghettos. The current government is determined to see this return as it erodes the few wins that we have had in the battles that we've fought. The Independent Living Fund, for example, and the tightening of access to work, surely the, the um, Department of Work and Pensions best kept secret. You know, access to work should be seen as the liberator for encouraging disabled people into work, not cut back and meanly managed by non-disabled minor bureaucrats who've got no knowledge or lived experience of disability. So to the new wave, many young disabled artists acknowledge being inspired and motivated by the clarity of the social model of disability and the work of earlier artists. But many temper that acknowledgement with the assertion that disability is only part of their identity. There is a reluctance to accept being defined within what might be described as the constraints of disability arts. Yet looking back, this has always been the case. Many of the artists prolific in the 1980s and the 1990s also worked outside of the disability arts arena. I don't feel like a diverse artist, nor do I see as diverse the work of many of the disabled artists whose work I regularly see or exhibit. I wonder what it's diverse from. I think we should no question the current notion to shoehorn disability into a diversity agenda. Perhaps another cul-de-sac, and yet another attempt by the many funders to create an alliance between all the art and culture it cannot understand. And by that I mean the art and social cultural positions of black, disabled or culturally different positions to its own. Working as it does to a predominantly white, male, middle class, British and elitist agenda. The artist Grayson Perry calls them default man. Um, I don't know whether you've read about default man. But he, he says that default man is rarely under threat and he's never described as part of a community. And by this he describes community as other, embattled, separate from society. And I just wondered if opera was diverse. It's a minority art form. It's simple stories told from an ancient past. It's performed in a, in a language that is not understood by the majority. <laughs> but it attracts a huge amount of philanthropy and many millions in public subsidy for the largely rich and upper class audience that it entertains. And we talked about rank and power. So disabled people are expected to be at the bottom of the pile when considering rank and power. If we weren't, the world would be a much more accessible place. But we have collectively little power to change things. The late Paddy Maysfield, who became disabled and happened to be on the 
Arts Council's trustee board in 1994 when the lottery money came into being, battled to ensure that public money spent on in, in, investing and improving the arts infrastructure had also to be accompanied by a commitment to making them accessible. And without him in a position of power, I doubt very much that we will be able to access many of the institutions that we have limited access to today. I did a survey. I just asked people in the street when they saw me, what did they see? They were a bit embarrassed. But after, after a while, they, start, they, they stated the bleeding obvious, which was they saw a disabled person. I don't think I'm diverse. I don't even think I'm a person with a diversity. Well, certainly not according to them. They didn't mention diversity once. I've got an impairment, it's pretty obvious. Millions of people do. I need society to recognize and accept that and actually address it. It's not a phenomenon. It isn't diverse. Disabled people have always existed. I think we always will. It's frustrating after 40 years of campaigning with others for full inclusion that we're still waiting. And we all need to be awkward bastards about the collective failure of society to include us. So, is the disability arts movement a forgotten movement? Or was it of its time, like abstract expressionism, and like almost every other art movement, was it a paradigm shift into something else, something other? Is disability arts, <laughs> and crucially different, art made by disabled artists, now part of a diversity agenda? And if it is, do we fit? Or did the art world make us outsiders? And should we reject being labelled at all and continue as generic weeds being cut down in order to flourish? Thank you.